Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. How's everyone doing? We are in 2023, full swing. You guys ready? Woo! Man, it feels like yesterday that we were in 2022. I heard the boo. Yeah, you made that. This is the only time you can make those jokes. I heard a boo in the crowd. Boo. All right, one more, one more. Man, I haven't seen some of you since last year. All right, that's enough. That's, 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 that's my tolerance level. How about yours? Yeah? All right, great. <laughs> well, good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm so glad to be here with you. Uh, it, it's, it's awesome to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I am Pastor John. I'm one of the pastors here at City Line. It's amazing to serve here uh, with all of you and uh, to be a part of this church family. It's uh, just awesome. Um, I-, I love when I get an opportunity to serve in this way, opening up God's word together. And so, you guys ready? Well, Pastor Mo mentioned that we are starting a brand new series. This series is called Momentum That Lasts. Momentum That Lasts. We have the campaign, Momentum, and we're going to be talking about momentum in our own lives, our personal lives, our connection, our relationship with Jesus. And this is uh, Momentum That Lasts. This week and next week, we're going to take a look at the life of the disciples in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. This week, we'll be looking at Acts chapter 1. And next week, Pastor Jason will be preaching on Acts chapter 2. But before we dive into the word, let's pray. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you uh, for allowing us to see a new day and a new year. And through great times of joy and celebration and even in times of difficulty and heartbreak and lament, We can all truly testify that you are faithful, God, that you are perfect in all of your ways. Father, that you are a good father, our father in heaven. We want to remember your goodness to us in every season. God, we pray for those among us who are experiencing sickness, depression, and even a challenging season. God, we pray that you would bring them healing, comfort, and rest. And Lord, that you would remind them and all of us of the hope that we have in you and that we are precious in your sight. Lord, as we open your word, would you open our understanding? Holy Spirit, would you lead us to the truth of your word? Would you allow it to reach the deepest parts of who we are and transform us from the inside out? I pray all of this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And we all say... Amen, amen. The title of this message is called Being for Christ. Being for Christ. If you have your Bibles, you can turn in Acts chapter 1. That's where we're going to be hanging out today, Acts chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5 to start. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. If you have it, say, yeah. All right. I'm actually a little surprised of how many people had it so fast. Good job. All right, here we go. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them, After his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. Everybody say wait. Wait. For the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Point number one, we're going to reflect, reflect. Luke, the disciple, the doctor, Luke, the the writer of the gospel of Luke, out of our four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Luke is the writer 
of the book of Acts. Now, in the opening line of Acts, it says, in the first book, O Theophilus. Now, those are strange words to open up a book with, right? It's not like in the beginning was the word like, that's an awesome entrance. But over here, this is meant to cause us to ask a really obvious question. In the first book, that means this is the second book. Well, what's the first book? And we find out right in Luke chapter 1, the gospel of Luke, that Luke addresses his gospel and also this book to Theophilus. In Luke chapter 1, he addresses Theophilus as most excellent Theophilus. Now, we don't know a lot about who Theophilus is, but by Luke addressing him as most excellent, he may have been some type of official, some, some person of status. But whoever he was, he was a follower of Christ. And the purpose and motivation of Luke writing both his gospel and this account in Acts is written in Luke chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And it says this, To write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. As a church, we spent over a year journeying through the gospel of Luke, which helped us to see the life and ministry of Jesus clearly. That Jesus wasn't some historical figure or some man that had great insight, but that Jesus is God. And that he was sent from heaven to fulfill the will of God the Father. Luke begins Acts with a quick recap of where he left off in his gospel account. He's bridging the gaps. He's connecting the dots between these two books. In this very quick recap, he establishes Jesus once again, not as a man, but as God, and shows the continuation of the work that Jesus started after he ascends. Luke 1, in this first verse, it says, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And this speaks into two things for us. Jesus' work on earth and his heavenly work. Let's break this down between the two. Jesus' work on earth. This is what Jesus did. Think about it. The healings, the feedings, the miracles, the forgiving of sins, the fulfilling of the law, the fulfilling of every prophecy, the, the dying on the cross, the purchasing of salvation, making a way to the Father. All of this is Jesus' work on earth. But while Jesus was here, he taught about the kingdom. And this was his heavenly work, what Jesus taught. He taught about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God, which is here, but is also coming. I love that. He taught of a way of living that was countercultural, not just back then, but is also countercultural now. He taught of a way of loving and forgiving, not just those who show us love, but loving and forgiving and praying for our enemies, those who persecute us those that cause us pain. He spoke about a way of kindness and generosity that shows no partiality and it's not based on whether we think someone deserves it or not. He spoke of a way of, of a peace and patience, forgiveness and hope that even in suffering or in great difficulty, that our value, that our joy is not tied to material things or circumstances because we've set our sight, our aim, our focus on things above. And he spoke of a new purpose of life, not just to get things or to get status, but to live at peace with God to make the greatest aim of our lives to please him and do his will here on earth, to learn how to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. What Jesus taught could not be done and cannot be done in our own strength, discipline, or intellect. 
This could only be accomplished by the work of the Spirit of God. Many people listened to Jesus' teachings, but not everyone heard. You would find Jesus saying, to him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Luke goes on to mention in this recap of his that Jesus presented himself alive after the crucifixion, after his suffering, that he was alive. And he did so through many proofs over a 40-day period. Now, this was a hot-button topic of their day. There was a buzz in the air that Jesus was alive. But as you can imagine, people weren't quick to believe or get on that bandwagon. His death was very public. Jesus had been a polarizing figure. Some people loved him. Some people hated him. So news of his death was widely spread. On August 16th, 1977, in Memphis, Tennessee, at the age of 42, Elvis Presley was declared dead. The doctor's report said that he died of a heart attack. But shortly after his funeral, conspiracy theories, stories, or for some of you, the truth, (laughs) that Elvis was not dead but alive, began to rise up. I mean, random Random stuff, uh, random reports. Oh, the day that he was declared dead, they said some man went into the airport, looked just like him, and bought a one-way ticket to, like, some foreign place. Or some people started calling in. I was standing in line in the supermarket, and you know who was standing behind me? Elvis. In his white getup. Nobody else saw him, just me. Then, you know, oh, you, well, you, you know the real story. The, the, the real story is he went into witness protection. And 45 years later, you still have people that believe he's alive. Elvis would be 87 years old right now. Right? And so you have people that will still believe that Elvis is alive with little to no evidence. But Jesus did not leave little to no evidence post-resurrection. You you understand this? This wasn't a a, a cheap photo. This wasn't a piece of toast with his image on it. This was Jesus in the flesh, alive. And he showed himself not just to a supermarket clerk somewhere in Israel. He showed himself to the disciples, to the apostles. In each one of the gospels, they give a snapshot of Jesus alive after the crucifixion, after the burial, he's alive. In every one of the Gospels, you see Jesus appear to Mary Magdalene. In Matthew and Mark, you see Jesus meeting with the disciples in Galilee and giving the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples and of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 24, you see Jesus appear to two disciples that were walking on the road to Emmaus. He spends the day with them, and it ends with a meal. And it says that when he broke the bread, that's when their eyes were opened. They realized, this is Jesus. And when they realize this is Jesus, he disappears. Those two disciples make their way to Jerusalem, and they find the other disciples, and they're sharing the story with them. And as they're sharing the story, Jesus shows up on the scene. Here in John chapters 20 and 21, we get more accounts of Jesus showing up to the disciples on many occasions. This is where we get Doubting Thomas, that story of Doubting Thomas. Jesus shows up to the disciples. Thomas wasn't there. Thomas shows up, and they're trying to tell him, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And Thomas is like, nope. Not going to be quick to believe this one. I've heard these stories circulating. Unless I put my hand in his wounds, uh, in in his nail-scarred hands, or, or touch his side, then I'll believe. And you know what happens. Jesus shows up. He's like, hey, Thomas. Awkward. 
We also get the story of Jesus reconnecting with Peter after his denial. The Apostle Paul later on in 1 Corinthians 15, he writes about this whole account of, of Jesus dying. It says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3, uh, starting with verse 3. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. Amen. That he was buried and that he, ra- he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Amen. That he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive at the writing of this account. <laughs> Though some have fallen asleep, which now they have all fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, the apostle Paul speaking. This is huge. This was not Elvis status. Jesus was dead, but now he's alive. He's alive. Think about the roller coaster of emotion that the disciples went through. Watching their master, their savior, crucified, beaten, whipped. Watching as he gave up his spirit when he said, it is finished. Watching him bury the mourning, the devastation. Some of them were like, what do we do now? But now he's alive. And he's with them, and he's eating with them, and teaching them, and giving them new commands. He's sitting with them. It's just like, yes, <laughs> excited. The last thing that Luke shares in his recap of these first five verses is the command that Jesus gave to wait and the reminder of the promise. Jesus had made a promise to the disciples, to the apostles. And we find this promise in John chapter 14, verse 16. And Jesus says to his disciples, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Later on in chapter 14 of the gospel of John, Jesus continues to say these things. These things I've spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. In John chapters 14 through 16, Jesus gives these promises and and gives some great instruction. And Luke is reminding us here in Acts chapter 1 of all that Jesus has said. Jesus said that he would send the Holy Spirit, the helper. But first, they have to wait. And for us, sometimes we have to wait, just like the disciples had to wait. And waiting is hard, especially if you're a doer. When you like to get things done, when you like to keep things moving, When you like to check the boxes off the list, I know how that feels. I I, I like that. You know what happens when you finish the list? Everybody knows the list, right? You know what happens when you finish the list? You get a new list. And you get to do it all over again. (laughs) Here they have to wait. Being a doer is good. And we're going to hear more about that in Acts chapter 2. There's going to be a time for the disciples to do. But before we get to doing, we can learn from what we see here. Before doing should come being. Being. Waiting is not just hard if you're a doer. Waiting is also hard when you're going through hard things. Sickness, 
depression, heartbreak, disappointment, mourning, stress, anxiety. In those times, it's, it's hard to wait. We kind of just want to get through those seasons really quickly. And the promise that Jesus gave of sending the Holy Spirit, he shared that he, the Holy Spirit, will be with us forever. That we will not be left alone or abandoned. That when we're going through the difficult seasons, that we will not be alone but that God would be with us right there. Sometimes when we go through a difficult season, we get consumed by everything that's going on around us. This becomes all we think about. It becomes everything that our emotions are spent on, and it begins to affect every area of our life, our thoughts, our health, our relationships, It even makes us forget what God has said and how good God truly is. In order to build momentum that lasts, we first need to reflect on what is true. We need to remind ourselves of what God has said. Not get caught up in the situation, but take a step back and remind ourselves of who God is, who he's been in our lives the prayers he's answered, the provisions he's made, the faithfulness he's shown in our lives. Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 8, says this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So this morning... I wanted to give us a little bit of time to reflect. It's a new year. I don't know what 2023 holds, but I know who holds the year, and that's our great God. And so we're going to take just two minutes to reflect, and here's how I would love for us to utilize this time together to remember, to think about God's goodness in our lives. Take the next two minutes, maybe write down a blessing that you've experienced from God this last year or an answered prayer. Maybe you want to take these next two minutes and pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Just thanking God for who he is. Maybe you don't know what to say. Maybe you don't know what to write down. Then I want to encourage you in these next two minutes, turn to John chapter 14. And allow the words of that chapter to minister to your heart. Let's take two minutes and then we'll continue.
Well, I pray you had a chance to maybe write something down and connect with the Lord and cultivate gratitude in our hearts for God has been good. Amen? Amen. Point number two, revisit. Point number two, revisit. Acts chapter one, we're going to read verses six through 11. Verses six through 11, we're going to continue on through Acts chapter one. This is what it says. So when they had come together, the disciples, they asked him, Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted and would and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Look up here. You can imagine the excitement the disciples now had that Jesus was back. They were ready. They were ready. They were ready to get things started, get things rolling. They had lived their lives under oppression. Israel was occupied by Rome. But I'm sure that as they grew up, they heard the stories of what once was with Israel. It wasn't always that way with Israel. Israel used to be on top. God's chosen people, the one true God on their side who was alive. I'm sure they thought of stories like Moses, the deliverer, who delivered them out of Egypt through the power and miracles of God. Or they think of the exploits of Joshua and the mighty city of Jericho come crumbling down. Or the conquering king, King David, with his many exploits. They heard of all those stories. And they thought that during Jesus' earthly ministry that they would see some of that. But then he died. But now he's alive. So now they're like, now? Do we get things started now? Is this like, I, I see what you were doing. You were, you were waiting and now, is, is this the time? God had something else in mind, has something else in mind. And what Jesus shares with the disciples is something that's good for all of us to remember. Jesus says this, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This tells us a couple of things. First, there are things this side of heaven through God's infinite wisdom that he will not tell us and that we will not know. Now, waiting is hard. Not knowing is also hard. And this requires faith on our part, faith in God. We were singing that he is a good, good father, that he's perfect in all of his ways. When we don't get the answers that we're looking for, we can trust that he is perfect in all of his ways. We can trust in his goodness, in his faithfulness towards us, his love towards us. And this is hard because some of us, not all of us, some of you are really good with not knowing. You wake up, you're like, I'm good. I don't need to know anything. I'm just going to kind of go on my day. That's good for some of you. But for others of us, we like to know. We like to plan. We kind of like to see around the corner before we get to the corner. 
We, we like to be in control. And this becomes a sticking point for some of us, not knowing. But here's where I would like to encourage you. While we may not be in control, there's a comfort in knowing that God is in control. And everything is better. Guys, everything is better in God's hands. Everything. Some of us can get caught up in the not knowing, and that becomes where we get stuck and unable to move forward. But I want you to see here, while the disciples didn't get an answer about the kingdom being restored to Israel, they were given instruction. And while there are things that God does not reveal, there are things that God has given us. There are instructions that he does show us. He tells the disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. He gives them the next steps. He doesn't leave them just wondering and wandering. He gives them direction. It wasn't the answer they were looking for, but he does give them direction. And here's the encouragement for all of us. Let's not get so focused on what God has not spoken. Let's focus in on what he has spoken. He's made so many things plain for us to know in his word. Commands for us to follow. Things for us to go after. And he's revealed so much. When we embrace the things that God has shown, then we get blessed in our own life here. Second, the second thing we see is a revisit to the mission. Jesus helped put the disciples' focus back on the mission and off of themselves. The mission was being a witness. Being a witness might sound complicated or even scary, but it's actually very simple. And whether you realize it or not, most of you are a witness more often than you think. A witness Uh, if you wanted to go by a definition, is a person who sees an event take place or a person who has knowledge because of personal observation or experience of a thing. Basically, a person is someone who's giving an account of what they saw or experienced. It's very simple. Right now, the biggest witness point, at least over the last couple of weeks in my friend circle, was how bad the airlines are with flights being canceled and people being delayed and layovers and stopovers and spending hours in the airport at friends call. Oh, yeah, uh, flight got delayed again. You know what they're doing? They're being a witness. They're giving an account to their experience. I'm not there at the airport, but through their report, I'm understanding, well, there's trouble at the airlines. Or, 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 think about this. Ever, ever go to a restaurant and have a really good meal? And then you start to share with your friends. You're like, oh, we went to someplace the other day, and it was so good. If you ever get a chance to go, you got to go. You realize that's being a witness. Ever see a good movie? Oh, man, I want to go see dot, dot, dot. It was so great. I loved it. It's being a witness. How many have been a witness at some point or another in your life about anything? Good experience, bad experience, when you get great customer service or when you get terrible customer service, we are keen to talk about it to anybody that would hear us. The question is, Has this translated into our relationship with the Lord? The things that the Lord does, the goodness that we experience, his faithfulness, his kindness, his provision, his mercy, his love, the things that we experience from our our Father in heaven, do we share those things with others? It's the same muscle. The thing you've been stressed about, And then God makes a way. God provides. The answer is given. Are we quick to share those things? 
That is being a witness for the things of God. This, this year, this new year always brings resolutions, and resolutions are great. It's a shift from the habits we've built that might not be so healthy or we begin to exchange it for healthier habits or anything like that, that's great. New eating habits, becoming a more organized person, becoming a better person, kinder, nicer, going to church more. Congratulations, good. If that was your resolution, day one, we'll check in at the end of the month. All of these things are great. But all of them take commitment. As part of this new year, would you prayerfully consider fulfilling the mission that God has given to all of us to be a witness, a witness of his goodness in our own lives, of the grace that we receive, the blessings that we experience, the communion with him that we get to enjoy each day. He walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. It's a beautiful thing. The same way we want people to experience a great meal or a great experience, we should want people to experience our great God and our good father. Let's take two minutes again, and I would love for you to consider a couple of questions. We're going to put them on the screen, and this is looking forward to this, this new year. Am I committed to being a witness for Christ? With all of your good plans this year, can this fit in of being a good witness, a better witness? What are two things, two areas that stop me from being a witness in? What are two areas that motivate me to be a witness? Let's take two minutes and maybe write some of these answers down. right here we go point number three remain we're going to finish off uh, Acts chapter 1 we're going to read verses 12 through 26 and uh, begin to end our time here together so if you have that there Acts chapter 1 verses 12 through 26 let's read then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, 
James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. This is Judas Iscariot, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted to share in this ministry. Now this man, Judas, acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who knows the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Look up here. Jesus ascends into heaven, and the disciples have been given their instruction, and they follow through. They head back to Jerusalem. They wait in the upper room, and while waiting, they devote themselves to prayer. Peter, at some point during this time of waiting and praying, gets up in front of everyone and reminds them of what David had spoken concerning Judas. He first quotes Psalm 69, 25, saying that his place shall become desolate. Then he quotes Psalm 109, verse 8, saying that he should be replaced. This leads to more time in prayer and where Matthias was chosen as the new apostle replacing Judas. What I'd like to point out here is what the disciples did while they waited. They devoted themselves to prayer, which led to the word, which then led to more time in prayer. While waiting is hard and not knowing is also hard, we can fill our time with this combination of the word of God and prayer. Now, the word of God and prayer should be present and accounted for in all of our lives as children of God, and we all said amen. All right, that was four of you. That's fine. I'll take it. But in times and seasons of waiting, of lament, hardship, of disappointment, it's good for us to increase our time in God's word and increase our time in prayer. These two serve as an anchor in our lives to keep us grounded. It's so easy for our minds to be consumed with worry or keep replaying the issue. And this allows anger and bitterness and offense and hurt to grow. It feeds it. And what you feed gets stronger. Instead, instead of dwelling on the situation, instead of dwelling on, on replaying the, the conversation, the argument, the offense, what if we devoted ourselves like the disciples did to times of prayer? 
times in the word. That would change us. It might not change the situation, but it changes us on the inside. We no longer become consumed by the replay. But we could think, just like we read from Philippians 4, on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is good, whatever is uh, worthy, we could think on those things. Times in God's word, times of prayer, times of worship, putting on some worship music in the car, in the house, beginning to sing those choruses that begin to stir our heart and connect us with our Father in heaven. All of these things lead us to reflect on the truth of who God is. And revisit our purpose that God has for us here. It all allows us to remain, to remain faithful and steadfast. We begin to feed on the things that nourish the deepest parts of us. And it won't allow things like worry or anger to take root in us. I think of Psalm chapter 1 that describes... I, the, this man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. He's like a tree that's planted by the water. His roots go deep. This is what helps to build momentum in our lives that lasts. When we start these things to reflect and to revisit and to remain. It's God's word that allows our roots to run deep. It's prayer and worship that allows the, the life to flow and keep us connected to the Lord in every season. And we're about to end our time together, and I'd like to end it in a time of prayer. How appropriate. In a time of prayer. Now, this might be a little uncomfortable for some of you, but that's okay. We're, we're going to grow in this new year. Amen? All right. So, let's try this. And whatever happens in the next few moments, I'm going to tell the next service that you guys did amazing. <laughs> so, no pressure. But if you're here with your family or if you're here with a loved one, I would love for you to gather together and pray together as a family. If you're here with maybe some friends, I would love for you to pray with some friends. If you came to church by yourself, I want you to look up and down your row. And find a group that you can join of maybe three or four people, and that's the stretching part. That's all right. We're all family here. And here's how I would like for all of us to pray. We'll put this on the screen. We'll have a time of prayer. Pray over each other for strength and for comfort, especially if you're going through a difficult season. Just pray over that person. This doesn't have to be long and elaborate. I know some of you are shaking right now like, I really don't know what to say. Keep it simple. Just pray, God, would you strengthen my brother, my sister this year with whatever they're going through. Pray, uh, pray for a deeper connection with the Lord this year. Pray, pray for a greater time in God's word and prayer. Pray a blessing over the person around you that God would bless them and keep them this year. Let's take the next two minutes to do that and then we'll close in prayer together.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so your youth is renewed like the eagles. Lord, we stand before you. We kneel before you. We bow before you in a new year, asking you to renew us, asking that we would be before we do, asking that we would be your witnesses, not try to witness, but just, just love you and allow your love to flow through us. Lord, we praise you for the word that has gone forth today. May it find good soil. May it grow and bear fruit that glorifies you. We honor you, we adore you, and we thank you, Lord. You are our perfect Father, and you're going to carry us through this year in ways that we can't even imagine, but it's going to be so beautiful, Lord. We're going to uh, revisit this time, uh, this time next year. We're going to reflect because we're going to remain with you throughout this whole year. We praise you in Jesus' name.